Okay. Okay, so today we have the pleasure to receive Professor Alberto Botta, which will make a who will make a presentation on the financial boom and the industrialization in uh, in uh, in emerging economies. So it's a great pleasure to have you there today, and we'll give you the floor right now, and then we'll have the group of students which will uh, present a discussion on your work, and we'll start an exchange. So thanks again. Okay, uh, can you hear me first of all? Yes, perfectly. Okay, great. Um, well, first of all, uh, apologies for not being there in, in person. Um, in this case, it was a, an easy jet problem because my flight has been canceled. Uh, my early morning flight has been canceled and I was not notified yesterday afternoon about this problem and there was no way to find an alternative flight to uh, come to Paris. So uh, sorry for not being there in person, but um, I hope that we can uh, anyway have a, a intense uh, uh, discussion, even though um, remotely. So let me start immediately with uh, with my presentation and uh, I will share the screen. Let me know if everything works well. So now you should be able to see my desktop and here there should be my presentation. Right? Yes, it's good, we see it. Perfectly. Okay, so let me first of all, uh, Can you all see it? Yes, so, it's good. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so what I'm gonna presenting today is a joint work um, uh, with uh, Giuliano Toshiro Yajima from University of Rome La Sapienza, now at the Levy Institute, and Gabriel Porsile from uh, um, CEPAL, the UN Economic uh, Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, what I will present today is a joint work with them, and it is part of a um, wider research project um, led by uh, CEPAL and UNCTAD jointly. The research project was launched in uh, end of 2020, beginning of 2021. And the topic was uh, uh, trying to figure out uh, which strategies and which policies to implement uh, in order to give rise to a transformative post-COVID recovery. So uh, facilitate uh, the return to growth of uh, um, developing countries, taking into account uh, the transformation of their economic system in such a way to make their development process more sustainable from an economic point of view, but also for an environmental point of view, and more sustainable also from the point of view of resilience to uh, shocks such as the pandemic. Our contribution to this larger research project was to think about the connection between uh, um, structural change uh, so the changing composition of the productive structure of developing countries, uh, capital flows, so uh, the mobility of international capitals, and the implementation of macro policies, macro prudential policies, external macro prudential policies. Then I will uh, define a little bit better what do we mean as external macro prudential policies. Uh, our contribution to this research project uh, has been now published uh, uh, in uh, industrial and corporate change. What I will present here is closely related to this uh, uh, recently published paper. And this is the outline, more or less, uh, of what I will present today. So very briefly, I will try to make a review or a very brief survey of uh, uh, how uh, productive development is important or how the productive structure of countries, developing countries in particular, is important even the more so um, at the time of the uh, pandemic, and even the more so in order to understand why the economic implications of the pandemic have been different in different areas of the world. Uh, obviously, uh, I will uh, put emphasis on the fact that countries characterized by a more fragile and less developed productive structure have been also those countries most heavily affected by the um, COVID-19 
from a human point of view, but also from an economic point of view. Then if the productive structure of countries uh, is an important factor to explain a, a exposure to uh, external shocks, the pandemic uh, among the others. Uh, and if productive development is very important to give, to give rise uh, sustained economic growth and sustainable economic growth uh, and economic development, we, uh, we have then tried to analyze which are the sources of persistent productive underdevelopment in developing countries and emerging economies. And we decided to put attention on capital flows, large capital inflows more specifically, as a potential source of premature deindustrialization. There is evidence that many developing countries are deindustrializing earlier and more extensively than what historically experienced by developed countries or successful um, newly industrialized countries, East Asian countries. Uh, we decided to analyze whether large capital inflows, periods of financial booms, or periods of financial bonanza, as we are used to label them, could be responsible, at least partially, for this phenomena of uh, a premature deindustrialization in developing countries. After this empirical study, then we draw from some uh, from this empirical study some policy implication in terms of the role. Um, potentially attached to uh, external macroprudential policy, not only as policy measures to stabilize from a macroeconomic point of view developing countries, there is almost a, uh, a transversal consensus among economists on this point, but also as a potential complement policies together with industrial policy in order to boost structural change and productive development in developing countries. So this is more, more or less the structure of what I will talk about uh, um, today. Uh, I understood that there, there will be discussion after my presentation. I also understood that my presentation should last for one hour, more or less. Tell me uh, if I'm right or wrong. Um, and feel free to stop me if I'm running out of time or alternatively, if there is any immediate question you want to make me, right? Uh, is it one hour time presentation, right? Am I correct? Yeah, yeah, it's it's exactly this. Perfect, perfect. So, moving on. Uh, as I told you, um, obviously, the outbreak of the pandemic has represented a, a major economic shock worldwide. Developed and developing countries alike have been affected and experienced harsh economic downturns as a consequence of the pandemic or harsh economic abrupt economic slowdown as a consequence of the pandemic. Uh, however, it is also true that the uh, economic effects, uh, economic implications of the pandemics have been uh, um, heterogeneous among countries. Some countries and regions have been uh, uh, affected more harshly than others. Uh, in, this is, for instance, the case of Latin America and South Asia. These two regions have been uh, uh, affected more intensively. Than other, than other regions of the world. Uh, there are many factors explaining uh, these. Uh, some of these factors are recollected to the, uh, are connected to the relatively less developed productive structures characterizing these regions with respect to developed countries or some developed countries and with respect to some successful uh, um, newly industrialized emerging economies. East Asian countries again, but also China, for instance, or uh, Vietnam. Which are the factors connected to the, to the productive structures of those countries that could explain why uh, the economic implication of COVID-19 in those regions have been so harsh? First of all, in a very simple, uh, and it is very easy to understand how the economic implication of COVID-19 has been very harsh in countries characterized by a very large informal sector, in this case, uh, with respect to GDP. And Latin America and South Asian countries are precisely economies characterized by very large informal sectors um, with respect to formal activities. Um, informality uh, is a, uh, an endemic problem 
in this economies. Informal sector represent the problem because uh, uh, workers, uh, employees uh, or employers in the informal sector in general uh, do not have any uh, social safety net, any formal social safety net against uh, um, shocks, uh, macroeconomic shocks uh, as COVID-19 was. And therefore, uh, having an, econom uh, an economic system which is less developed and characterized by a larger informal sector, characterized by larger and deeper informality, represent by itself uh, a problem because a larger part of the labor force, a larger part of the population is exposed to uncertainty and risk. Secondly, uh, there are signs of weakness also in terms of the sectoral composition of the formal sector. Because if we look, for instance, at the service industry, Latin American countries, with respect to East Asian countries, for instance, are relatively more concentrated in so-called contract-intense low-skill industries, like retail, transportation, hospitality. And these have been, obviously, the most affected industries in the world with the outbreak of, of, of COVID. There's no need to talk about the um, very deep consequences suffered by the hospitality industry. This is always obviously the same of uh, uh, retail, uh, retail industry when there were lockdowns and uh, um, country closure. This is also the case of transportation, even though a little bit less with respect to the other two industries. In any case, contact intensive low skill industries, in particular in the service sector, have been very strongly affected by COVID, and these are by far the most relevant services characterizing the productive structure of Latin American and South Asian countries. Differently, with respect to some, in some cases, Arab countries, but more importantly, emerging Asian countries, which specialized more, when we talk about services, in high-tech or high-knowledge intensive services, which are also tradable, related, for instance, to education, business consultancies, um, that kind of activities and services that are um, increasingly uh, traded internationally, thanks to uh, new information technologies, and which could be delivered anyway, even though remotely. Um, this is, again, not the case of Latin American countries and South Asian countries. It is more the case of uh, successful Asian economies. Um, Last point, last point, uh, obviously, at least uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, in the first month of the pandemic, uh, there has been a significant downturn in the prices of some primary commodities. Then there has been the reversal in the dynamics of those prices. But at least at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, um, the international price of primary commodities, uh, such as uh, oil product, experienced a huge downturn and obviously Latin American countries as big exporters of such primary commodities suffered a lot, were high, heavily exposed to the negative consequences of such a downturn and the price of their major exported goods, creating obviously a much tighter external constraint to the growth process of their economies. So these are some factors explaining, in a way, why the economic implication of COVID-19 have been ushering some economies uh, rather than others and exposing more heavily Latin America and South Asia with respect to other, some other emerging countries. Now, if productive underdevelopment exacerbated and could explain a good deal of why some countries have been more exposed to COVID-19 than others, it is obviously important to understand which are the causes of such persistent productive underdevelopment characterizing some regions of the world. Why some regions of the world uh, continue to experience uh, a persistent problem of productive underdevelopment and cannot progress uh, towards the development of different sectors uh, more high-skill intensive industries and services in their economic system. 
So that's the point uh, we tried to analyze in our research, trying to go back uh, and trying to understand which were the causes and the sources of such a persistent productive backwardness in some uh, uh, developing and emerging economies. This could be applied also to some uh, supposedly developed countries. Take, for instance, some peripheral countries, so-called peripheral countries in the Eurozone. In order to analyze uh, um, this topic, uh, in analyzing, better to say, this topic, we decided to put emphasis uh, on the role of capital flows. Economic literature has provided uh, many different uh, explanations for the persistent underdevelopment, productive underdevelopment of some um, uh, developing countries, of some developing regions. We decided to focus on the role played by capital flows, international capital flows. And in order to do so, we decided to combine two pieces of the literature. One is the literature coming from Danny Roderick and uh, analyzing from an empirical point of view, the process of premature deindustrialization. Danny Roderick in 2016 was one of the first publishing a contribution, an empirical contribution on the possible causes or, or better to say detecting the possible existence of premature deindustrialization. I will try to explain very briefly what do I mean as premature deindustrialization. And we try to combine that piece of the literature with um, other contribution, putting emphasis on the role of capital flows, capital inflows and periods of financial bonanza in particular, on the changing productive structure of uh, uh, countries, developing countries in particular developing countries first and foremost. So the role, the connection between capital flows and the changing sectoral composition of countries, developing countries in particular. First of all, try to define premature deindustrialization. Um, as you know, uh, the process of economic development uh, is tightly connected with the process of uh, changes in the structural and the sectoral composition of the of the economy traditionally when we observe the development experience of developed countries we have a period in which uh, at the very beginning of the development process countries are primarily rural economies then there is the progressive expansion of the service industry and the manufacturing industry more important so here there is the an upward um, phase in the contribution of manufacturing to both total and total employment and uh, um, GDP creation, nominal and real GDP creation. So there is this uh, initial increase in the um, manufacturing sector contribution to GDP and total employment. And then uh, a process of deindustrialization starts uh, in which the contribution, the relevance of manufacturing to either uh, GDP or unemployment starts to decline. This is well represented more or less by these uh, inverted U-shaped curves. These are taken uh, um, from uh, Danny Roderick's paper in which there is clearly the standard trajectory followed by manufacturing in terms of contributing to the economic system. Contributing either to GDP, nominal and real GDP, or alternatively, or alternatively to employment creation. So this is the standard trajectory that we would expect manufacturing to follow as a sector contributing to the generation of employment and GDP inside a given economic system. Premature deindustrialization is obviously associated to the fact that in some countries, apparently, the contribution of manufacturing to employment and GDP started to decline earlier or more intensively than what historically experienced in developed countries. So for instance, this is the red line in the Danny Roderick's figure. The red line represents an idea of premature deindustrialization because as you can see, after 1990, in some countries, the contribution of manufacturing GDP to, um, of, sorry, the contribution of the manufacturing sector to, in this case, uh, um, real GDP, started to decline at the lower peak and earlier with respect to which, uh, what was recorded if we took data before 1990. So this is a one indication of uh, um, premature deindustrialization. 
And this evidence could be coupled with evidence provided by Gabriel Palma, who is an economist, who is a Chilean economist uh, um, working in Cambridge, in a contribution published in 2005, uh, providing again evidence in different years of premature industrialization. If we took data up to 1960, we would have had uh, a manufacturing employment share which started to decline when manufacturing contributed roughly 35% of total employment. And from that point on, it started to decline. If we, um, and at this level, yeah, we have the log of income per capita. This was the starting point of the contraction of the reduction of manufacturing employment contribution to total employment in the served economies. If we take data before 19 up to 1970, we can see that the uh, contraction of manufacturing employment share would have started around 30% of total employment. And we can clearly see this downward trajectory, this downward move of the trajectory of manufacturing employment over total employment being evidence of premature deindustrialization if we move our data, if we extend our sample of, uh, of uh, our, if we extend our time spell and we extend our sample of data moving towards uh, uh, the 80s, the 90s, and then the 2000s. So this is premature industrialization. When the contribution of manufacturing to either GDP formation or total employment starts to decline earlier than what we would expect uh, looking back to the experience of nowadays developed countries. Um, as said, if this is the definition of premature deindustrialization, there are some previous contribution that provide some evidence of prema premature deindustrialization. This is a series of contribution telling us, okay, there is evidence of premature deindustrialization. Danny Roderick in particular. Danny Roderick in 2016 was one of the first uh, um, elaborating an empirical model, trying to check, uh, trying to uh, capture the existence of uh, premature industrialization. In particular, what Danny Roderick did was to introduce this uh, um, equation in which we introduced some uh, structural factors uh, trying to capture the inverted U-shaped curve we would expect that manufacturing uh, uh, shares would follow throughout the entire development process. So this is, for instance, GDP per capita and GDP per, and GDP per capita square. This is population and population square. And these factors are supposed to act as a structural components in the development process, capturing the normal, the expected U, inverted U-shaped curve that manufacturing shares, that manufacturing contribution to either GDP or employment uh, should follow. Then the Roderick added some specific dummy variables for different decades, for the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, with the purpose of capturing evidence of premature deindustrialization. And in fact, and in fact, Danny Roderick captured the, the, this evidence at least for some developing countries, not all developing countries, but at least for some of them. A subset of African countries, excluding Mauritius, for instance, Latin American countries, much less for um, Asian countries. The point here, the relevant point, is that this contribution, Danny Roderick first, but also the others, are very important because they provide evidence, empirical evidence, of the existence of premature deindustrialization. The point is that they do not explain which are the factors behind the um, premature deindustrialization, which were the forces leading those countries to um, deindustrialize or giving rise to a process to be more specific of demanufacturing earlier than expected. And uh, with the Subdimensioned manufacturing um, uh, manufacturing sector with respect to what was the experience of developed countries. So our goal is precisely to try to um, discuss a little bit better which are the forces behind this process of premature industrialization, and what we claim is that capital flows 
large capital flows in particular, periods of financial booms, periods of financial bonanza could play a role in this. Um, here it is a brief review of the theory, brief of review of the theory in order to capture different bits of uh, uh, previous economic literature, finding somehow uh, a rational for our story, finding somehow some uh, uh, or discussing how much our story could be plausible, if it is plausible to think that there might be a connection between uh, uh, capital flows uh, and uh, premature industrialization. Uh, I need to add one small thing here. Um, we decided to focus on this topic also for this reason, uh, because to some extent, uh, after all the financial crisis uh, um, that hit developing countries in the 90s and in the beginning of the 2000s, there is a sort of agreement among economists that large capital inflows uh, due to their instability could increase the vulnerability and the instability, the macroeconomic instability of developing countries. Now, I would say that there is a sort of consensus between some mainstream economists and most heterodox economists in saying financial liberalization, financial integration, and exposure to large capital inflows could be destabilizing from a macroeconomic point of view for developing countries. The negative implication of financial integration, however, is mainly framed from a macroeconomic point of view. So it is an analysis carried out mainly at macroeconomic level, pure macroeconomic level, focusing on pure macro aggregated variables. What we would like to analyze, what we would like to investigate is also if there might be some persistent negative consequences of financial integration and exposure to large capital inflows, also from a more, from a deeper point of view, from a structural point of view, uh, trying to capture which could be the connection between exposure to large capital inflows and productive development and structural change in developing and emerging economies. I close the parentheses. Let's come back to the potential mechanism connecting large capital inflows to the evolution of the productive structure in developing and emerging economies. The first mechanism is what I labeled in some of my previous contribution, financial Dutch disease. Probably you have already heard about the, the Dutch disease, the traditional Dutch disease. The traditional Dutch disease is the reduction in the relevance of manufacturing due to the discovery and the exploitation of uh, large endowments of natural resources. And it is labeled Dutch disease because it's referred to the historical experience of the Dutch economy in the 60s, when large endowments of gas were found in the Northern Sea. Um, in some previous contribution, uh, Hai and others labeled and introduced the concept of financial Dutch disease in the sense that we said, okay, it's not only, Dutch disease is not only caused by uh, the exploitation of natural resources, but could also be caused uh, and triggered uh, by exposing countries to large capital inflows, to large uh, um, international capital movements. Why? Because large capital movements uh, in periods of financial bonanza, large capitals could enter developing countries, uh, and most of the time they give rise to an uh, appreciation uh, of the real exchange rate. The appreciation of the real exchange rate is in turn the mechanism through which domestic tradable goods, in particular non-traditional tradable goods, manufacturing, lose competitiveness with respect to foreign goods and with respect to non-tradable goods, the service industry, the domestic service industry. And this is the main mechanism through which domestic manufacturing could be crowded out with respect to other um, domestic sectors, non-tradable sectors, services in particular, or alternatively, the tradable sectors connected to the exploitation of natural resources uh, themselves, and with respect to um, international competitors in the manufacturing industry itself. So this is first the, the first channel, the first negative channel, as you can see, there is the minus sign here, connecting uh, surges in uh, capital inflows and uh, the industrialization, possible sources of premature industrialization. The, the first mechanism is the mechanism 
uh, passing through, passing by the appreciation of the real exchange rate and the ancient negative con consequences on net exports, the competitiveness of domestic non-traditional tradable goods, um, namely manufacturing. There's however another mechanism, another mechanism that is potentially positive, as you can see there is the plus sign. Uh, this mechanism is related to the potential balance sheet effects of large capital inflows. What does it mean, this? It means that in developing countries, very frequently, some companies are in the, domestic companies are indebted in foreign currency. So they and make profits in domestic currency. So there is a currency mismatch in their balance sheet. In these cases, when there are large capital inflows entering the economic system and giving rise to the appreciation of the nominal and real exchange rate, exchange rate, those companies experience improvements in their balance sheets. Their balance sheet is more solid because uh, the burden of their foreign liabilities gets smaller. So their balance sheet becomes more solid. When the balance sheet of those companies becomes more solid, there could be therefore stronger incentives to invest. So since that their balance sheet is stronger, they could be incentivized to invest more. And if investments are used to improve the productive structures of those countries, to improve the efficiency and the productivity of those economies, then the possible connection between a real exchange rate appreciation as due and led by financial capital inflows and the dynamics, the structural dynamics of the economy might be positive. The problem is uh, very frequently this is just an upward and expansionary phase of a standard Minskian cycle. Because even though, at least initially, there could be a positive balance sheet effect due to foreign exchange rate appreciation and a more solid balance sheet, at some point, economic actors and firms themselves could realize that they got too much indebted. They accumulated an excessive amount of foreign debt, and they also uh, made worse the possible problem of currency mismatch. Why? Because they perhaps used those cheaper external funds to invest not that much in the expansion of their production capacity to cater international markets and to give rise to more exports, but to accumulate more fragile financial position inside their economy. For instance, there are some recent evidence suggesting that many companies get heavily indebted in foreign currency when, when, the, when the domestic currency was very much appreciated with respect to international currencies such as the dollar or the euros, but they did not invest in the export-oriented sector. They are mainly invested in domestic services like the real estate, like the so-called fire sector, finance, insurance, and real estate. And in this case, the mismatch becomes heavier. And in this case, if there at some point there should be a reversal in the dynamics of the exchange rate and the exchange rate depreciation follows initial exchange rate appreciation, in this case, we are in a downturn phase of a traditional Mexican cycle. And obviously, this will have devastating detrimental effects on investments and the dynamics and the stability of the economy as a whole. The final possible uh, mechanism spotted in this figure is a credit channel, because obviously the effects of capital flows over the productive structure of the economy depends, if it depends, on which sectors capital inflows target. Do they target the real estate sector? Do they target the service industry? Or do they target manufacturing? Obviously, depending on the sectorial allocation of uh, um, international funds, different pictures could emerge. If international funds um, aim at financing, expanding export activities, obviously our judgment should be much more benign than um, capital, international capital, uh, international funds concentrating in the domestic real estate sector and giving rise to an housing bubble, for instance. And that's why there is the question mark here. It even depends on the sectorial direction of international funds, of international capitals. <laughs>
which are the sectors expanding the most or benefiting the most from the possibility to get access to cheap, easy international funds? That's the question. There's the question mark here, even though there is plenty of evidence according to which periods of financial booms at worldwide level and in developing countries are tightly connected with, um, how to say, um, expanding um, domestic services, in particular the real estate. The real estate is the typical target of periods of financial, um, of financial booms, of financial bonanza. So these are the several mechanisms that could connect capital flows to the evolution and the productive structure of developing and emerging economies. What we try to do, uh, and, and here, sorry, this is here some pieces uh, of uh, um, literature, of empirical literature, in this case, uh, existing before our contribution. I was involved myself in a paper discussing the Colombian case uh, and discussing in specifically whether uh, Colombia was exposed to a process of uh, uh, premature deindustrialization or progressive deindustrialization after the discovery of large endowments of natural resources and after being exposed to um, large amounts of FDI for indirect investment targeting Colombian natural resources connected then to speculative capital inflows. There is another contribution by Pablo Bortz finding uh, a, um, the, uh, a positive correlation between uh, exposure, in this case, to gross capital inflows and the expansion of what I labeled before the FIA sector, which is finance, insurance, and the real estate. More rel relevant for our contribution, there is a publication by uh, Benigno and others finding out a negative link between surges in capital inflows and resources allocated away from manufacturing. Uh, or better to say, resources allocated to manufacturing in the sense that here the link is negative. So the larger are capital inflows, the lower is the amount of resources, productive inputs mainly, um, allocated to manufacturing. And therefore, surges in capital inflows could be a source of premature reduction in the role, in the macroeconomic role of manufacturing. We try to, as I, as I said before, we try to put together these different pieces of the literature, trying to, if you want, to expand the original contribution by Danny Roderick. And we expanded the original contribution by Danny Roderick in two ways. I will explain very briefly, which is the econometric equation we used in our model, the um, estimation strategy we adopted in our model. We tried to um, expand Danny Roderick contribution also in terms of uh, the dependent variable used to measure the process of uh, premature deindustrialization. Danny Roderick in his contribution mainly used three indicators. The manufacturing nominal and real GDP share, uh, nom manva and real manva, and the um, manufacturing employment share, manemp. We keep on using these three uh, variables. On top of these three variables, however, we also add the economic complexity index, which is a broader indicator, which goes beyond manufacturing and tries to capture, even though tightly connected to the um, level of development of manufacturing. The economic complexity index is a broader indicator of the technological capabilities and the technological complexity of a given country of the productive system of a given country. So the higher is the economic complexity index, uh, the more developed uh, and supposedly more technological advanced uh, should be the productive structure of a given economy. So we took uh, Danny Roderick uh, regression, we expanded it a little bit uh, through uh, the um, addition I will explain in a short while, but we expanded it also in terms of the set of dependent variable used uh, to check whether large capital inflows could be source of premature deindustrialization or more broadly speaking, a reduction in technological capabilities and in the level of complexity characterizing an economic system. This work by Daniel Rodriguez was to some extent integrated with previous contribution just mentioned by Benigno and others. Um, 
emphasizing a negative link between surges in capital inflows and the evolution, the dynamics of the manufacturing sector. What we did differently with respect to Benigno is that we use direct data about some types of capital inflows. Benigno data is basically, they look at data about the current account as a mirror of capital inflows. As you know, in the balance of payment in general, a positive slash negative current account is mirrored by a negative slash positive financial account. So then uh, Benigni and others uh, look at the current account uh, as an indicator, as a mirror for what happens in the financial account. We decided not to use this uh, uh, indirect strategy because this indirect uh, strategy has se several shortcomings. In particular, it takes into account the full um, financial account, whilst we were more interested in some specific types of capital flows. And secondly, there may be a role played by um, uh, variation in foreign reserves explaining uh, the deficit or surplus in the current account. So we were not that much, uh, very much satisfied uh, with that indirect strategy. Therefore, we decided to focus on more direct data about some types of capital flows. And we decide to focus on, in particular, net portfolio investment in international credit. So we decided to focus on the most volatile components of capital flows, keeping net values, so focusing on net portfolio and international credit um, net inflows. And we also decided, therefore, to exclude from our computation foreign direct investment and uh, uh, the variation of foreign reserves. We decided to focus on portfolio investment in international credit precisely for the reason I said before, because we were interested to analyze whether the most volatile forms of capital flows could have an effect not only on the pure macroeconomy, not only on the pure macroeconomic stability of a country, but also on their productive structure. And that's why we decided to focus on these specific two items um, in the um, financial account of developed and developing countries. This is the uh, equation uh, we estimated, in which obviously there are the structural factors a la Roderick, structural factors, structural sources of the industrialization a la Roderick, what I said before, what, what I already um, described before. In this case, we had the a dummy variable, which is not related to specific decades, trying to see whether in those decades uh, there have been a reduction in the contribution of manufacturing to either GDP or employment. But we added a um, financial dummy variable. So a dummy variable, which is activated in periods in which capital inflows, capital inflows related to portfolio investment and international credit have been abnormally large, larger than usual. So our definition of financial booms, of periods of financial bonanza. We uh, conceived the dummy financial variable according to three, three criteria. These are the three criteria through which if they are jointly satisfied, if they are satisfied all together at the same time, that dummy financial variable gets equal to one and it is activated. It gives us the idea of a period of financial bonanza, a period of financial booms in which some types of capital um, flows are flooding an economy more than usually. First of all, obviously, the idea is having net non-FDI capital inflows, which are non-negative or equal to zero, so positive net non-FDI capital inflows. Those positive values should last for at least three years in a row. So the period of uh, financial bonanza should be relatively longer and cover at least the medium run is not the usual definition of the long run has five year time spell. So at least three year. And uh, the amount of capitals entering developed and developing countries should be larger than normal. It should be the average, the um, sub-period average should be larger than the full period country-specific average augmented 
by 10% of one star the division. So we want to be sure that effectively in those periods, uh, there were capital flows which were persistently more abundant and far larger than what a specific country was used to experience all along the time period we uh, have included and we have considered in our study. There are some other, um, how to say, um, control variables, like the level of, uh, um, these are the control variables we included, the degree of trade openness of the economy, uh, the growth rates of the rest of the world to uh, take into account how manufacturing development um, in a given economy was influenced by the dynamics uh, of the rest of the world. And we also included a variable capturing the importance of natural resources. In this case, it is the share of natural resource, natural resource related rents uh, over uh, GDP. And this is a very um, brief specification of the country, the sample of country we used. Uh, it is relatively narrow in the sense that we used countries uh, that Danny Roderick included uh, in its original estimation of premature deindustrialization. Um, we included those countries that Danny Roderick originally considered them. Um, whenever we had data about uh, um, financial capital inflows. So uh, from that sample of country, for instance, uh, um, Ethiopia, Malawi, Morocco, Taiwan, and so on were excluded because we didn't have data about financial flows in those countries. We had data from 1980 to 2017 through the, the um, through uh, that definition of our dummy variable, we um, recorded 61 episodes of uh, large net non-FDI capital inflows, or call them financial booms. The estimator we used in our analysis is a OLS um, panel corrected standard error estimator because that estimation strategy uh, enabled us to control at the same time for all the different problems that this type of data could have, uh, like heteroscedasticity, um, uh, autocorrelation, union roots, uh, or um, sample uh, dependence correlation. So this was a um, very uh, effective estimator for uh, our problem. Let's, let's go to the results now. And the results uh, are this one. In this case, we focus on uh, um, the manufacturing employment share. So the first dependent variable we consider is the manufacturing employment share, MANEMP. Again, data from 1980 to 2017 for the whole set for the whole countries included in our sample, 36, or alternatively focusing only on emerging and developing countries or alternatively developed economies. And what we can see if we look at the role of uh, um, booms in financial inflows well as you can see the coefficients here are as expected and significant bold numbers represent significant values from a statistical point of view and the negative value is expected so in periods in which there have been a surge uh, in capital inflows in speculative capital inflows in periods in which um, net speculative capital inflows have been more abundant than usual, in those periods, there has been a reduction in the contribution of manufacturing to, the, to total employment creation. This is true for all countries. And uh, if we take uh, either countries alone, that indicator is also true, but it is not statistically significant in the case of developing countries. The same evidence emerges if we then move our analysis and we take manufacturing contribution to nominal value added. And in this case, as you can see, the negative implication of periods of financial booms over manufacturing development in the case of the full country um, sample and in the specific case of the countries is confirmed. This is not so in case of developed economies. In the case of developed economies, the coefficient turns positive, even though it is uh, non-significant. In the case of uh, the um, real manufacturing value added share, the coefficient is again negative for in the three different specifications. 
for the three different uh, samples uh, we take into account. Uh, in a way, this, this result was expected because even uh, um, from um, a simple, very simple statistical and descriptive analysis, uh, the real manufacturing value added share in general is uh, um, far more stable than the nominal manufacturing value added share. So evidence about uh, an inverted U-shaped curve in the real manufacturing value added uh, is much lower with respect to what we see in terms of employment and in terms of the nominal value added share. And obviously there is a role played here by the uh, relative price of manufactured goods with respect to um, price of, uh, prices of uh, uh, other goods and services in the rest of the economy. But in any case, uh, even in this, uh, even for this uh, uh, dependent variable, the coefficient remains negative and in line with our expectation, albeit uh, it is not statistically significant any longer. Final estimation for this first battery of analysis. Now we move a little bit away from pure manufacturing and we take the economic complexity index as our dependent variable. And again, here yeah, we can find a negative coefficient, which is also statistically significant, statistically significant, and this applies to both emerging and developing economies and also developed economies. So apparently, periods of financial booms are detrimental as to the uh, economic complexity, technological complexity of countries, and this could apply to both developing countries and emerging economies and developed countries, even though the magnitude of this coefficient, of this negative coefficient, is larger in the case of developing countries with respect to developed ones. In the process of uh, um, revising this uh, research for the final contribution, some comments told us, okay, but you analyzed uh, all uh, emerging and developing countries altogether, there are significant differences between uh, different developing regions uh, at worldwide level. And that's why in the revised version of this paper, we also tried to split our sample of uh, uh, emerging and developing countries in different regions. And therefore we focused on some Asian developing countries, including and excluding China, the first columns in this, uh, um, in this slide, Latin American countries, and then African countries. And we repeated our estimation, just focusing on, on these subsets of developing countries. If we look again at the role of periods of financial booms uh, over manufacturing employment share, here we can see, again, even for this subset of countries, we find uh, uh, significant negative uh, effects over uh, the manufacturing employment share. And this is particularly so for the case of uh, Asian developing countries, Africa. The coefficient remains negative, but it is not statistically significant in the case of Latin America. This picture, in terms of manufacturing employment share, is uh, to some extent different uh, and the thoughts uh, with our findings in terms of manufacturing uh, um, value added share. Because if we move to nominal value added, manufacturing value added, now we can see the picture is the other way around. We have negative and statistically significant coefficients in the case of Latin America and Africa, whilst uh, in the case of Asian countries, uh, the coefficients either remain negative, but statistically insignificant, or they even become positive, even though still statistically insignificant when we exclude, when we take out China from our sample of Asian countries. And this dichotomy gets even stronger if we look at the real uh, manufacturing value added share. Because in this case, uh, there is a negative coefficient in Africa, there is a negative coefficient even though not statistically significant in Latin America, what we have for Asia, including or excluding China, are positive coefficients, even though not statistically significant. So in a way, there is a kind of a different picture if we look at the manufacturing employment share or manufacturing contribution to either nominal and real value added. I will say a word on this in a short while. When we look at the economic complexity index, all 
uh, coefficients are negative, but they remain statistically significant only in the case of Africa. The reduction in the level of statistical significance of this indicator is partially due to a problem of the related to the size of the subsample, because as you can see, the numbers of observation decreased massively, and therefore, in some cases, even though the coefficients are in line with our expectation, they become um, statistically insignificant. Coming back to my previous observation, so the dichotomy and the differences we see, whether we look at the uh, contribution, manufacturing contribution to employment, or alternatively, manufacturing contribution to nominal and real GDP, this is, to some extent, our explanation. As we can see, as we saw, the uh, manufacturing employment share reacted negatively to and, 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 and showed sign of financial aid premature deindustrialization in the case of Asia. Uh, a little bit less so in the case of Latin America. It is precisely the opposite in the case of uh, manufacturing contribution to nominal value added or real value added. In the case of Asia, we also we had in some cases, in some regressions, uh, even positive values. Why so? One, um, two possible explanations. First of all, there is evidence that capital surges in Asia were more strongly associated to booms in investment, manufacturing investment tools, not only real estate investments. So in, 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 in Asia, much more than Latin America and Africa, financial booms were connected to surges in investment, productive investment tools. And therefore, to some extent, surges in capital flows were connected to the expansion of those industries and those sectors leading to exports manufactured exports in particular. And this is evidence coming back from the 90s, but also more recently, Araguchi et al. published a paper, if I remember well, in Structural Change in Economic Dynamics in this point. Second point, and this is more specifically related to the negative effects of financial booms over uh, manufacturing employment in Asia. Keep in mind that several East Asian countries are still strongly have still strong um, productive specialization associated to positive uh, real comparative um, revealed comparative advantages in some labor intensive sectors like textile. Uh, this is the case of China, but this is also the case of some other East Asian countries, Asian countries, sorry, including our sample. In those sectors, when there is, whenever there is a real exchange rate appreciation related to financial booms, it has been very important to improve, increase labor productivity and reduce employment with the purpose of preserving international competitiveness and keep those countries competitive on international markets. Obviously, this is a case specific to Asian countries because in the case of Latin American countries and uh, African countries, those countries in general don't have strong, uh, persisting strong specialization in some labor intensive industries. And therefore, that's why in those countries, which are mostly dependent on the exploitation of natural resources, there was um, much less need to improve productivity and reduce employment to keep um, competitiveness in those sectors, which are much uh, less developed in those countries with respect to Asia, which are far less important in those countries with respect to Asia. So, and this to some extent explain our puzzling finding. One more point, one more point important is that not only not all developing countries are equal, but not, uh, not all manufacturing sectors are equal, because we can also see different dynamics if we focus on manufacturing sector as a whole, including therefore also those labor, um, low skill labor intensive sectors like textile, footwear, uh, furniture, and so on and so forth. Or alternatively, if we focus just on high tech manufacturing. If we focus on high-tech manufacturing consistently with other contribution, we see that there is much less sign of premature deindustrialization in particular Asian countries, while on the contrary, high-tech industries are expanding. These are forecasted trajectories of um, high-tech manufacturing sectors. So we rerun re regression just focusing on high-tech manufacturing, and we um, plotted the estimated development of the sectories the sectors 
as you can see much less sign of uh, um much less sign of uh, um premature industrialization in high tech manufacturing in particular in asian countries whilst uh, obviously uh, high tech manufacturing is uh, much smaller in latin america here we see is much smaller in Latin America and in Africa. And in these two regions, there are more signs of premature deindustrialization, even in the high tech industry. I think I'm running out of time, um, but please tell me, uh, tell me how many minutes more I have. Uh, I'm saying this because uh, I finished the explanation of the econometric results of our analysis. We ran also some robustness check, which in general uh, confirmed our finding. Um, there are some more slides uh, uh, talking about the uh, theoretical implication of our findings and the policy implication of them. But perhaps I can leave them for the uh, discussion after students' feedbacks, after a student's presentation. Tell me what you prefer. So you have a little bit more time to present your policy uh, recommendations. Yeah. Okay. Fine, fine. So I will skip uh, the theoretical implication. The theoretical implication, uh, I will share with you the presentation uh, and, um, and in case we can discuss later. Uh, the uh, policy implication, if uh, large capital inflows could bear these negative consequences on the long-term productive development of uh, uh, countries, emerging and developing countries in particular, it becomes very important to tame as much as possible those capital flows, tame capital mobility related to those, those types of capital flows, and at least redirect those capitals in such a way they could become more um, beneficial for the long-term development of the economy. So this is, uh, a, that's why we think that external macroprudential policy, external macroprudential policy is that macroprudential policy that looks at the interaction between international capitals and the evolution of the um, macroeconomic soundness, uh, soundness, the internal macroeconomic soundness. Uh, uh, we think that external macroprudential policy should be attached to, should be should complement better to say industrial policy uh, it is important to recognize that external macroprudential policy doesn't play a purely macroeconomic role but it also affects the uh, productive trajectory of countries and therefore first of all um, external macroprudential policy could enable uh, developing countries to reduce pressures on the appreciation of their exchange rate. So far, developing countries try to tame um, financial-led pressures on the appreciation of their exchange rate, causing premature deindustrialization by accumulating foreign reserves. But accumulation of foreign reserves come at the cost. So accumulation of foreign reserves come at the cost of uh, um, expanding the um, quantity of domestic currency, as you know, therefore giving rise perhaps to problems of uh, domestic inflation. And if the expansion of the domestic currency is sterilized by selling public bonds, uh, this could create problems in terms of increasing interest rates and uh, uh, reducing the space for fiscal policy in developing countries. And this is a problem in itself if, first of all, fiscal policy is also used via public investment to support productive, um, productive uh, um, development of the economy. And also because uh, if uh, uh, sterilization um, action taken by domestic monetary institution increase the domestic interest rate, they uh, feed even more the persistent problem of larger capital inflows entering the economic system because obviously higher domestic interest rates tend to incentivize even further um, capital inflows. Secondly, as, uh, as I just mentioned, 
uh, external macroprudential policy should be given a, a sectorial approach in recognition of the role external macroprudential policy also plays in terms of uh, influencing the productive development and the economy. And therefore, we should take uh, a um, sectorial specific approach. I will move to this final figure, because this tells us that on top of taming a broader macroeconomic problem related to Minskan cycle, we should introduce, for instance, differentiated measures impeding speculative capital is directed towards uh, um, the real estate sector, for instance, but perhaps uh, um, um, making easier capital is directed towards uh, um, domestic uh, manufacturing or the expansion of some manufacturing industries oriented toward exports. So very much happy if there are um, portfolio investments, uh, equity purchases, uh, which aim to expand some domestic manufacturing industries, giving them an international profile, giving them an international perspective and enabling countries to uh, participate more strongly and more strategically to international goods markets. It is precisely the opposite if equity purchases are directed towards speculation in the real estate sector. And therefore, we should adopt a sectorial perspective sector what what we label sector specific measures in terms of incentivizing foreign capitals directed towards the expansion or aimed at the expansion of the domestic manufacturing non-traditional sector with respect uh, those capital inflows that could potentially give rise to a uh, real estate booms uh, not only for the negative macroeconomic consequences generally associated to, for instance, real estate booms or speculation of financial markets, but also for their negative consequences in terms of uh, uh, structural changes in the productive structure of developing countries. I stop here. There are some references uh, and uh, here there are the links uh, uh, through which you can find uh, the published article and also the full report, but I will share the presentation um, with you uh, in case you are interested and uh, I now stop the sharing of uh, of the video if then there is other questions on some specific slides uh, happy to go back uh, and to make more comments on them thank you a lot okay thanks a lot for this very interesting presentation now we we'll, we're going to have the the students who, which will make uh, uh, comments remarks and to start start the exchange of the words with the rest of the room so i leave the floor open to to them so that they can present uh, and, and thanks again Do you have some slides to share? Yes, yes, okay. This side, I think, doesn't matter. Can we stay this side or that side? Okay. Uh, we're going to need this, I think. So we're going to do like a like this. <laughs> Everything is served by the camera. What? Everything is served by the camera. I know, I'm thinking like, how do you present? Ah, okay. Yeah, I think that, I think, well, it depends on what part. 
que te sinto bem yeah. e complementar, não é? Agora, se calhar, vai ter um sound problem, não é? So we'll go to Gold Spiral. Hey guys. Can I start? Um, hello, everyone. Hey, Professor. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. We're very sorry you couldn't take your flight uh, from Greenwich. And yeah, we're very happy to discuss this. I think it's going to be a good discussion with you and also with the class about the importance of, of development and, uh, the, of course, your topic that I just presented, uh, how financial bonanza caused premature deindustrialization. Okay, so our idea for today is first present a little bit more of the problematic on, and I think bring very many insights from development economics that we didn't have so much in, in this joint seminar. Um, then discuss quickly the main takeaways that you just presented, and then come for the policy implication debate. Okay, so what is the problem of premature deindustrialization? Oh, I don't know if you can see this actually. Um, but this is, okay, I'm gonna try to show. This, this is the graph of manufacturing value added as percent of GDP. Uh, this is the world level. Uh, this is Latin America and the Caribbean. And this is um, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. It falls here. And I think what's very interesting to see here is that uh, regions like Latin America and, and Africa, they have uh, strong deindustrialization since the 70s. And even uh, Sub-Saharan Africa that already had uh, low levels of GDP, of manufacturing to GDP, around 18%, uh, it still had a very uh, strong deindustrialization coming to around 13% in average nowadays. Okay. And then why manufacturing matters, right? Uh, I think here we, we have discussed a lot about the climate crisis and, and the climate crisis brings the question on how much do we need of more industry? Uh, what's the effects of growth on the environment? Um, and also this, the boom of the service sector has brought a lot of debate within development economics on how much industry is really necessary. Uh, why can countries grow with services uh, for example, uh, the case of India. Okay, this literature actually defends that manufacturing um, is very important for the economy. Um, so this literature is very based on Caudo and uh, his analysis in the 70s and 60s when he was looking at many countries in the world and how these countries, uh, why some countries will grow more than others. And then he generally saw three things that is now called the, the Calder laws, but more than laws, it's, it's empirical investigations on why some countries go more than others. Uh, and then one cause is that manufacturing causes accelerated growth of output. So in all countries, manufacturing was always the engine of growth. It was what brought growth uh, to uh, accelerate. Then there is the Verdun's law, which is the idea that productivity in manufacturing is endogenous to manufacturing output because you have learning by doing. Not only manufacturing grows, but when it grows, it also increases productivity of the manufacturing sector itself. Um, and third, you have um, the aggregate productivity growth positively related to the, to, to the manufacturing output and negatively related to non-manufacturing employment. So uh, productivity is very related to, to manufacturing and then growth uh, is very related through productivity uh, to manufacturing. Then you have the Latin American structuralist uh, argument, which is that industrialization is a way out of dependency. Um, 
on one hand, because when countries like the ones in Latin America that were exporting uh, many raw materials and food, uh, the demand for those goods would not increase as much as the demand for other goods, because when people have more income, they're not always buying more food, but they are they might buy more cars or more smartphones or more gadgets and more technology. And of course, those countries don't want to sell uh, food or raw materials for the whole life and not uh, and buy computers and cars and, and technology. Uh, then there is a the, uh, strong literature come from Hishman, which uh, relates manufacturing to the quality of jobs in other sectors. So uh, manufacturing is very linked because if you have more industry, you're going to need more transport, you're going to need more uh, financial sector. So it, it's very related to other sectors of the economy, um, like services. Uh, but of course, this has a tipping point. Like we're not saying that we should always grow manufacturing uh, forever or that the whole economy should be based on industry and manufacturing. Uh, but in all countries, what we've seen is that after manufacturing reaches a tipping point, uh, these countries become much more technological. Um, they enter into the technological competition and then in, it, it is deindustrialized. So in terms of manufacturing to GDP, uh, but with good services. It's just to think about that here in Europe, uh, you have services, or in the US, you have services like Google or, or like the financial sector, which pays much better than Ubers uh, and delivery, which are more than 30% of the services in, in countries like Brazil. Um, yeah, so what's happening in this in, in, in Latin America and Africa is a premature deindustrialization, as the professor discussed, exactly because it's coming before this tipping point. So it's not that it's creating technological services, but it's creating just low paid precarious uh, services instead of um, good jobs. And then I think this is a very uh, instigating phrase. I think it's uh, interesting to bring to this classroom here which is by Haraguchi, which is one of the uh, references the professor presented, which is almost no country has achieved and sustained a high standard of living without making significant development in its manufacturing sector. The only countries that did so were the oil rich countries and small financial havens. And I think, uh, of course, here we talked a lot, I just talked a lot about links between manufacturing and growth. And sometimes you can think of this growth just in terms of GDP or just this abstract number of what is the economy. But this is much more than that. So when we're talking about this, we're talking about access to hospitals, to healthcare, to housing, to electricity, to good quality of, of living in general. And this map, uh, unfortunately, too, maybe too hard to see, shows uh, levels of food insecurity. Uh, and there's some parts that is white because there's no data. So there's no data for China and India, which are the biggest countries, unfortunately. But it's very interesting because whole North America and Europe have less than 10% of people on the food insecurity. But when you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, you have almost the whole subcontinent on more than 50% uh, of people that don't have uh, enough nutrients on a day-to-day -day basis. And in Latin America, always above 30%. And this is 2020, and it has gone even worse in Brazil, I know. Here it was around 35%. And now, in the end of 2022, it was 55%. So 55% of the population don't have enough to eat. And this is what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, manufacturing and development. So this is the what this literature is debating. So it's this debate on, on development. It is a literature on development, which the professor um, is part of, and also authors that, that I, I would call it a structuralist or, or post Keynesian, Caldorian uh, development literature. And it, because uh, it has a different view on economic growth. It sees economic growth as sector specific. We are not just growing the economy, what I've abstract that is, but we are growing certain sectors. Uh, and I think this is very interesting because when we, when we learn, for example, about the solo growth theory, it doesn't have any, it doesn't have any economy. Like it's, there's no activity, there's no, um, there's not no sectors, the economy just grows as a, as a whole because of this technological change. And even the new endogenous growth model, which uh, has research and development, the only sector that exists is research and development. 
So I think it is also is good for us to think about like when we learn about economics, how much we learn about in our own countries, do we know what is produced? It's like we are economists, do you know how much of your country's uh, percentage of manufacturing is or if if it's manufacturing what is what is producing what are the services that your country produces i think we are, we are economists and we usually don't quite ask ourselves these questions about the the sector specificities of our countries right yeah and this brings directly to the empirical evidence of maturity industrialization that the professor has already presented um but it's still a very embryonic empirical literature on the causes of it and I think this is very interesting. It's where the, the, the paper that the professor just uh, presented falls right in, um, linking into the financialization and the foreign capital outflows as one of the possible causes of the industrialization. Thank you. Well, uh, now we're going to the empirical part of the paper. Uh, we run the risk of being repetitive. However, um, actually we, we wanted to point out the interesting findings of this paper. And I, it has been explained before, this is the econometric formula. Uh, the first uh, five betas, where we, we can consider them as the structural from the, um, actually used by Roderick. And the fifth one, uh, which is the financial dummy that tries to identify the, the high capital inflows of each country. The other are control variables. Now, the dependent variable, we have it as the share of manufacturing over total employment, also the complex index. Um, so now I think that this has been explained before. However, uh, we would like to point out that this variable is what we consider the, the most important part of, 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 of this analysis. Why? Because it's uh, actually built by the authors and are, it's built by three requirements. Uh, as you can see there, uh, uh, the professor already explained it. Uh, we are taking uh, into account net inflows, not gross inflows. I think that's worth mentioning. Also, uh, we, we, we must point out that this is uh, already discussed by the authors, but also uh, it's found in the literature that accounts for the financial inflows that are actually like are taking into account this kind of factors. Now, um, like it said, uh, like it says here, uh, we have, we in the, in the econometric analysis, we can find some statistically significant negative imp impact on all the 36 countries. Uh, 10 of them are developed economies. The rest of them are developing economies. Uh, and uh, we also find statistically significant negative impact on the nominal manufacturing share to GDP. Now, what are the main takeaways? Uh, again, uh, we uh, in the study, it's found a negative cash flow relation between the periods of capital inflows and not only the share of GDP and also of the, of the share of uh, employment of manufacture over the total employment, but also in the complex of uh, complexity index. Now, um, when there's a capital inflow, when there's a financial bonanza, uh, there's also decrease on, on manufacturing share. It would be GDP or in the employment. And also there are loss of high skill productive sectors. Now, uh, like it was said before, again, um, it's between developing economies, just comparing the developing economies and not the developed economies, we found differences in the financial bonanza periods. Uh, firstly, uh, comparing um, two, two uh, well, the three regions, uh, we have that in, in terms of the manufacturer employment, the high financial bonanza cycles are affecting more the Asian countries and Africa rather than Latin America. Now, in the case of Latin America and Africa, uh, the surge in non-FDI capital inflows it squeeze the manufacturing GDP shares, something that doesn't happen actually or is not found significant in Asia. And uh, this can be due to, as already explained before, that the financial bonanza in Latin America and Africa, it could be used in consumption. And in Asia, it uh, has been said that it's used on more investment. Therefore, more, pro uh, more investment brings more productivity and therefore the manufacturing share doesn't decrease. To make like a more in deep um, 
okay, the light is not favoring us today, uh, but to make like a more in deep uh, analysis, uh, we like in in the like in the analysis, uh, it's compare some some countries, specific countries. We have the case of Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico. Mexico, in this case, it's like the outlier with the manufacturing uh, employment share doesn't decreases. And however, you cannot see it, but here there are some great areas. For example, here, here in Mexico, and over here. And all of them, like actually you can see it in the paper and I recommend you to do it. In all of them, when there's the great areas uh, refer to the financial bonanza periods. So when there's a high financial bonanza period, there's a negative relation towards manufacturing employment. Okay, so that's like the main takeaway. And it it, it happens in all these three countries. Also, again, um, uh, we here it's uh, South Africa, India, and China, where you can see that there's like a the significant difference between the manufacturing employment share, China regarding to the other countries. However, again, uh, here it's compared the um, the periods of high liquidity, and in cases of periods of high liquidity, there's a lowering uh, trend of the manufacturing uh, employment. So this is like one of the questions that we are going to present at, at, at the end of this presentation. Is this, uh, why is the financial bonanza shock relevant for economic complexity and nom nominal manufacturing share to GDP, but not the other dependent variables in the estimation? And how sensitive can the results be to the heterogeneity between countries and different capital inflow shocks? Thank you. Um, last but not least, I'll quickly talk about some policy implications. Um, whoever has had a look at the paper, there are a lot of them in there. And I'm not going to go through all of them because, um, yeah, that is to be read in the paper. Uh, what is so generally to be said that we're talking about capital flow management policies, because what we're really at looking at is the capital inflow uh, into certain economies. So what we want is a macroeconomic to increase macroeconomic stability uh, and emphasize structural change towards a more producing um, economy and not only non-tradable goods. Um, if we look at empirical findings or the paper looks at empirical findings of a lot of people and a lot of research, um, and they kind of all come to the same conclusion that capital inflow per se cannot be reduced with those policies, but the um, contribution they have to different industries um, or how they are coming in um, can be influenced. Um, so they can be modified away from debt instruments. They can be uh, they can re uh, reduce um, foreign exchange um, uh, denomination uh, and generally strengthen financial stability, macroeconomic stability, um, and reduce fragility. So um, um, if we then look a bit on a smaller scale, which is what is also debated in the pack, uh, in the paper is sector specific capital flow management policies. And we were wondering if they are not exactly the link between um, capital inflows and the diversification um, in the productive system. So if you could actually say where the money is going that is coming in, basically, either you invest in that or not investing at all. Um, so we can see that, for example, in East Asia, that there has been a, a big emphasis put on export orientation, and therefore, as a background of that, more advanced industrialization, which now makes them more resilient to global shocks um, compared to other industries. Um, and we were wondering is, if this is not also the crucial point for um, intersectional policy approaches, so where we could actually address the challenges of the climate crisis or of inequalities um, to implement that in those types of polit policies. Um, now we're stepping a step away from what is said specifically in the paper uh, and based with empirical findings. Uh, what we were also wondering uh, in terms of discussing um, the policy implications is um, how different is the environment on a global scale now to, let's say, an earlier time of industrialization in the 1970s, where the general global environment was more towards industrialization and productive industrialization, 
Um, so a lot of countries were doing that. Now it might be much harder for countries to move on the value chain because their place is kind of already set also with a governance framework um, that kind of holds them there. So is it possible for Latin American countries, for example, to move up in the value chain to become a really like heavy producing industry or are they kind of like hold, held at that place um, of agricultural production? In Asia, for example, there was that shift made. So they were moving on a scale. How possible is that today still? Um, that is something open to debate. Also the role of development banks um, and what their kind of strategy or dogma is behind all of that. And if that is not creating imbalances on a global level, because if we look um, at yeah, the, um, the Chinese project, the One Belt and One Road Initiative, we heard a lot about, I think, the last one and a half years, that is definitely going into producing industry, but who is actually benefiting from it? Is it only China who brings those investment into a country, or is it actually the countries who receive the investment? Uh, and it's also contributing to global inequalities. And, and that has been discussed by... Um, just before the COVID-19 pandemic obviously changed a lot on a global level. We saw that with like supply, uh, supply chain and um, crises afterwards, a whole ship can basically um, yeah, bring everything out of balance. Um, but we also stay, uh, saw that the, state, uh, the role of the state really changed um, again to a more powerful um, state who is investing, who is actually setting um, a tone in where to go. And I can only say that for Austria, the country I'm coming from, there's currently a big debate about um, getting producing pharmaceuticals back into the country because there's a shortage of mostly every needed antibiotic, for example. Uh, and that's definitely something, something the whole country would have to focus on, but also see on how can they be competitive enough in like the international framework. That leads us to our four questions. Um, we had them structured through the presentation a little bit. Um, I think it's easier to just read them uh, and then have more time to debate them, except in leaving them out. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Usually it's now the way that you ask our questions, uh, answer our questions a little bit, um, and then we start into an open debate with the students and the question as well. So we usually divide the time between the kind of closed debate and the open debate. Sorry, maybe if I can contextualize a little bit the first question, Professor, but I don't know if you were there. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I hope the... Um, the, we, we couldn't see you. I, I hope the presentation was I'm listening boring. to you. Okay. I'm listening uh, to you. So about the first question, I think you mentioned it about our, uh, already during your presentation that the real manufacturing to GDP share is uh, much more stable yes. um, than the nominal one. And uh, we, this is more of a clarification question. If it, this was already expected and how like these sensitivities of the results that you showed uh, also, when you talk about the difference between the, the regions, um, if you think that can undermine the results somehow and, and how you see that difficulty um, in terms of the methodology. Okay. So let me first address this point. Um, in terms uh, of not significant, uh, the not, not significant, so our result in terms of the real manufacturing GDP share, this was something expected because this is a common finding uh, throughout all the papers uh, which investigated this topic uh, for, for the reason I told you in the sense that in general, uh, the real manufacturing GDP share is much more stable than uh, um, other dependent variables. Uh, and therefore, even the, even the evidence per se of premature industrialization is much weaker if we look at the real manufacturing GDP share precisely because there's a role played by relative prices in there. So either is the, role, the, the usual discussion in which uh, labor productivity growth is much stronger in manufacturing than for instance in services and therefore uh, manufacturing manufactured goods prices are declining more with respect to the price of services or other non-manufactured goods. And therefore there's a uh, uh, 
to some extent, uh, uh, obviously, these decline in relative prices of manufactured goods with respect to other goods or services in the economy is not captured, uh, um, doesn't influence real manufacturing GDP share. And that's why real manufacturing GDP share is much uh, more stable than, than other variables. And, and, and again, this is a common finding that statistical uh, evidence about premature deindustrialization or deindustrialization per se is much weaker when looking at that. Um, I think this is not that much related to the heterogeneity uh, between countries in the sense that th there are differences between countries, that's clear. Um, I don't think this is the main reason why data about real uh, uh, manufacturing GDP share are, um, are less clear cut with respect to the others. Uh, there are other contributions emphasizing that what we should really look at uh, is uh, the manufacturing employment share. There is a contribution published uh, in the Cambridge Journal of Economics uh, putting emphasis on the fact that the crucial variable to understand whether there is a, the important contribution of manufacturing to overall growth uh, is the um, share of employment, share of manufacturing employment uh, um, uh, with respect to the other um, uh, indicators we used, uh, dependent variable we used. As to the economic complexity index, uh, keep in mind that the economic complexity index uh, is somehow related to manufacturing uh, and somehow related to the extent of diversification of the economic system, uh, because in general, uh, the economic complexity of the country tends to increase uh, the more diversified is an economic system. Uh, but it is a kind of subtle indicator because it is also uh, related to, um, first of all, it is connected to export data only. It is not connected to the um, GDP share, sectoral GDP share in general. It takes into account export data and it focuses on the sectors in which a country has a revealed comparative advantage. So it, it is related to how much a country export of a given type of good with respect to the benchmark with, with respect to the control sample, let's say. And therefore, again, there's a connection between economic complexity and the degree of development of manufacturing, but they do not overlap precisely. So perhaps part of the different results we get if we focus on economic complexity may due to the specific way in which economic economic complexity index is computed and measured, which again focuses, for instance, uh, on exports, not on manufactured goods produced for the domestic market, for instance. And this is a clear, uh, important point to uh, emphasize. Um, I would like to make reference to one of your previous comments, uh, or better discussion you had uh, among yourself in the classroom, uh, in the sense the potential contradiction between uh, manufacturing development and uh, environmental sustainability, just uh, one one word. Um, indeed, when we talk, uh, when you talk with development economists in general, uh, when we talk about the problem of climate change and environmental sustainability in developing countries, uh, the at least the heterodox economist, uh, structuralist economist, they are used to mention the so-called uh, um, sustainability trilemma. The sustainability trilemma means that there are three points which is hard to put them all together. One is uh, um, economic development, which is much needed in developing countries, and it is hard to um, obtain it without manufacturing, unfortunately because manufacturing has some specific features, and in particular for large economies, large in, in the sense of the size of the population, it is very hard to conceive successful development without manufacturing. Uh, the evidence of uh, African countries you um, uh, have shown in your slide is very clear. There's a very nice term coined by Fiona Trajena, who is another important economist from South Africa discussing about premature industrialization, talking about uh, um, pre-industrialization, deindustrialization in the case of African countries. So countries which started to deindustrialize de -industrialize even before the kickoff or the beginning of a serious attempt of industrializing their economy. But anyway, coming back to the trilemma, the trilemma is that sustainable the economic development is hard to conceive without manufacturing development. Uh, 
um, manufacturing development could be fundamental and needed in order to, um, how to say, remove another bottleneck of economic development, which is the so-called uh, external constraint to growth, which is the fact that you need uh, import goods and you need our currency and you need to diversify your economic system and give rise to some exports in order to then pay for the imported goods you need, for the imported capital goods you need. Obviously, this could not be consistent with environmental sustainability. So it's very hard to put these three things together and this is the trilemma. If you want to combine all of them, obviously, very likely, you need to uh, put together a very strong emphasis on structural change and technological upgrading, obviously putting emphasis on technologies which are meant for making the system more environmental sustainable. Uh, it is a very complex uh, and probably this is not reachable unless there is a big form of coordination between international between countries there's no discussion about that from a personal point of view so you really need a very strong form of coordination such that the development process in developing countries is made easier by accommodating policies taken also by developed countries in terms of for instance their technological upgrading and so on and so forth to some extent i would also say that manufacturing not necessarily comes at odds with environmental sustainability if we think that some agricultural sectors in developing countries uh, um, are very much energy consuming and they generate also a huge amount of CO2 emissions. So in general, if you think an a, a rural economy as more consistent with, the, uh, with preserving the environment, this is not necessarily true. So extensive cultivation in some Latin American countries uh, could be tremendously consuming in terms in, in terms of uh, energy absorption uh, and could be um, tremendously damaging in terms of CO2 emissions. So um, in a way, to some extent, uh, manufacturing development and uh, um, industrialization does not necessarily come at the cost of uh, more environmental damages, even though obviously this is not the case of China, for instance, in the sense that the Chinese development or Indian development uh, uh, could come a cost of environmental, uh, um, more environmental damages. Um, coming to the other points, uh, let me uh, read them very briefly. Um, uh, the, 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 the real problems of implementing uh, um, uh, capital flow um, managing uh, policies, management policies. Um, I think that in any case uh, here, uh, the case of Malaysia, for instance, uh, uh, is a good example of a country that controversially adopted some uh, capital controls in the wake of the East Asian financial crisis, 1997-1998, and Malaysia was uh, um, to some extent successful. Here, I think the most relevant problem is a problem of political will, to be honest. So uh, political will in the sense that obviously the introduction of some capital controls might have negative effects on some um, interest in your economic system. Uh, perhaps could uh, um, be detrimental and could harm the interest of some uh, elites in the economic system, which are highly international in the terms of their investment pattern. So that's clear. But I think that to some extent is more a problem of uh, international will more than not. Um, even though some form of international co coordination is obviously needed also in this case, because there will be many legal strategies to how to say circumvent uh, um, legal restrictions to uh, capital movements. In some cases, uh, I would be very tranchant in sense of forbidding sometimes of capital flows uh, completely uh, in this sense. Um, how important were geopolitics influenced capital and technology transfer? Um, uh, in the development of Japan and Asian tigers. Uh, this, is, this was fundamental, and this is replicated when we look at China. Uh, there is the so-called 
flying uh, uh, G's paradigm. Uh, the, the flying G's paradigm is the idea that um, um, the first comers in Asia, in terms of industrial development, at some point moved some stages of their production processes to uh, developing countries. This is for precisely the case of Japan. So Japan initially started to delocalize part of their production processes to South Korea. And South Korea uh, took advantage of those uh, delocalization or outsourcing processes coming from, from Japan in order to build up its own uh, industrial apparatus. So there is evidence how, how this is the so-called paradigm of the flying G's. So the first goes uh, uh, living and flying is a is a, a how to say a guide is a guidance for um, for other countries and it is connected to other countries both from the point of view of um, um, manufacturing investments in other countries outsourcing or delocalization of some of the production processes in search of lower cost when domestic cost and wages start to increase but also in terms of uh, uh, incentivizing trade because an increasing amount of trade relationships inside asia for instance Asian countries, to some extent, I could say in this way, form uh, a more integrated uh, trading bloc in itself. Um, and this is obviously the consequences of Japan coming first, as first in evil industrialized country in the region, and then providing guidance and support to other countries following that way. Um, Professor Bota? Yeah. Excuse me to interrupt you. Would it be possible just to speed up a little bit so that we can have a bit of time to have the open exchange with the, the rest of here. the classroom? I stop oh. here. Okay, I'm <laughs> sorry for the, no, no, for no, the, no, the fine, transition, which is a bit rough, but it's just to have a bit of time for the exchange with the rest of the room. Just don't me call professor because uh, it, uh, this okay. makes me feel very <laughs> old. So if you call me, okay. that is more than enough. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> No, okay, no, no so, problem, no problem. So now we're going to start the second part of the of the open discussion and the rest of the room will raise questions. So please just make sure to to tell me what is your name, okay? Just before you take the 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 mic so that I can take notes of who's participating. Okay, so Um, may I? Um, okay, thank you, Alberto. Um, thank you also, João, Judith, and Man Manuel for presentation. My name is Gabriel. Um, I'm from Major B2, yeah, <laughs> Brazilian. I don't know how, how many information I need to provide about myself. Santos Carneiro. It's a double, so I have two surnames. Yeah. <laughs> So, sorry, Professor. Um, so, I have two questions. First one, um, it is about uh, um, this recent literature about autonomous components of the demand as a, a leading component of growth um, in countries. And I'd like to know, because in the channels of the, of the, the work and that you presented, um, maybe i don't know if there is an inflow of of capital um this would leave more um space for policy space for expenditures mm -hmm. from the government that could maybe i don't know um uh, if well designed lead, lead to more um industrialization and how do you think if, if there is a conflict between this um, these ideas of like exchange rate and, and optimal exchange rates and Dutch disease against this new literature of uh, autonomous components. How do you see if there's a conflict or not? And the second question is, is about, okay, after the 2008 crisis, we see that there is a, the, the capital inflow, uh, capital inflows are, are going back to the center, uh, to the, the uh, developed economies. And obviously, we see a lot of other authors saying this is also not good for developing economies. Um, and I'd like to know, yes, obviously, at the end of your article, you come to this sectoral approach. But 
it seems that it's not exactly the amount of uh, uh, foreign uh, capital that comes and go, but it's particularly the kind of it. Um, and if you could go more deep and explain more which sectors, if you could name sectors and get into some details about which sectors are actually very good for this, um, please, I'd like to listen more about this. Um, thank you. Okay, I think there's another question before you answer. <laughs> yep. Uh, my name is Mohamed Lebib. I am uh, Major B2. Uh, so I have a question about uh, the interaction between uh, global inequality, global financial flows, and industrialization. So if we assume that there is an increase of inequalities, say in in country A, and that there there is not enough investment opportunities in country B. So we we could assume that capital will flow to country to to, to another country, say country B, uh, to earn more 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 interest. But this basic framework fails in the face of recent evidence because we see that we live in a world that that is highly unequal yet. Uh, since the 2000s or since the 90s, we don't really see new countries uh, becoming more industrialized. Uh, obviously, that capital has funded uh, financial speculation, uh, has funded more more investment. And I'm I'm just asking why didn't the rise in global inequalities uh, result in an increase in industrialization? Okay, shall I answer or there are more questions? Hey Alberto, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I'm Juan Manuel Campana. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, in one of the econometrics exercises you perform, um, you link financial booms to the manufacturing value of the share, either nominal or real. And I was wondering if, uh, given the manufacturing share is a relative measure, hmm. uh, the results could present a negative relation, for example, even if the manufacturing se sector wasn't shrinking and like there hmm. wasn't a net destruction of the industrial sector, but it was more that maybe the other sector was growing much faster, like the services sector. And um, if you control for that in your exercise, or if you think that could be important for the results. Thank you. Okay, other questions or uh, shall I answer these ones? Yeah, I think you can answer. Okay. Um, so as to the first question, uh, obviously you're referring to the Raffian literature about the super multiplier and so on and so forth. Um, so this is an interesting literature and coming back to your point, the connection between uh, capital flows uh, and um, say domestic expenditures, uh, fiscal policy mainly, as a, an exogenous component of uh, aggregate demand. Uh, well, actually, I will tell you that now I and my co-authors, uh, with uh, including also um, um, Danilo Spinola, we are working on a paper precisely on this uh, in the sense that we find actually uh, the opposite. Uh, I mean, for the time being, we just developed a theoretical model. But how, what we claim is that financial integration uh, and exposure to more cap to more capital is. Uh, actually reduces spaces for fiscal policy and exogenous components uh, of expenditures. Why? Because in general, in case of developing countries, uh, when there is a financial boom, uh, the economy initially goes through a period of expansion of economic booms, together with uh, uh, increasingly negative current uh, and trade accounts. In those cases, fiscal policy in general is asked to become more restrictive than expansionary. So in general cases, even though in developing countries, there is evidence of um, fiscal policy um, pro-cyclicality. In general, what we claim is that when a country is more financially integrated, 
And when a country is more exposed to uh, surges in capital inflows, uh, given that these capital inflows could lead to current account deficits uh, and um, worsening trade accounts, uh, so much more imports than exports, uh, domestic countries, uh, domestic governments, sorry, are demanded to implement uh, restrictive fiscal policies more than expansionary. So I would say that the uh, exogenous components of demand uh, um, are more restricted than uh, uh, expanded during periods of financial booms. Uh, and there is also, this is consistent with the idea of, in a way, of the bonds vigilantes. So um, the idea when uh, the financial integration uh, uh, originally in the mindset of neoliberal economists, uh, they uh, suggested that to financial uh, liberalize and integrate countries precisely to put tighter ceilings uh, to um, domestic fiscal policies, which in their views were perceived as the real problems uh, of macroeconomic stability in developing countries. Obviously, I don't agree with the perspective, but I would say that financial integration uh, goes against uh, um, more uh, exogenous expenditures than not. Second point, uh, capital flows after the 2007-2008 financial crisis. Well, actually, you're right that there was a quick uh, reversal in capital flows uh, um, in the middle of the crisis uh, in 2008 and 2009 in particular. But keep in mind uh, that capital flows towards developing countries uh, have never been larger than uh, after, 2000 and, uh, after 2010. So um, 2010 uh, on uh, has been generally considered a period uh, of uh, extraordinary large capital flows towards developing countries. Why? Well, obviously, because uh, there was the huge amount of liquidity put into the system by whole quantitative easing measures adopted by most of the central banks in the world. So there were different forms of uh, and different tapering at different times. But think about also what happened with the outbreak of COVID. In the first months of 2020, there was a quick capital reversal of capitals away from the periphery, from the periphery of the world financial system towards the center, and then when PEP was implemented in Europe, when the Bank of England intervened, when the Federal Reserve pumped a lot of money and a lot of liquidity in the international global system, a huge amount of capital went back to developing countries. So I would say that um, it is rather the opposite. Uh, in the full report, there are some uh, descriptive statistics uh, stressing that uh, from 2010 on, uh, it was the longest period with uh, uh, the strongest amount of capital flows towards developing countries. The problem is uh, some economists in developing countries, uh, some some of uh, some close friends of mine, Esteban Perez Caldente from the from 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 Cepal, for instance, they are claiming that differently with the traditional Minskan cycle, in which there was a financial boom together with an investment boom. Uh, what many developing countries experienced uh, was a boom in capital inflows, uh, but without a boom uh, in investment. So uh, that's the, the, the most relevant problem from their point of view. And the sense that they didn't see any uh, change in productive investments. They are claiming uh, there have been an increase in the financial fragility of those countries because most of their capital have been used for speculation inside their economies uh, in real estate bubbles and so on and so forth. So this is a problem. Third point, inequality, capital flows, and industrialization. Well, uh, I would say that uh, capital flows are not that much interested uh, in global inequality standards uh, because in the end, uh, uh, international capitals move in order to take advantage of uh, um, um, profit opportunities, more than profits, uh, um, rentier opportunities, so um, opportunities for speculation. So they are not really that much interested in uh, global inequality standards. Actually, um, historically, you see records of surges in capital inflows to developing countries uh, after processes of uh, financial and economic liberalization, which came together with uh, huge increases in inequality, at least in those countries. So I would say that capital flows are not connected at all uh, to inequality. They could be even connected positive, positively to inequality. So in general, at least speculative capitals 
could even worse the problem of inequality rather than uh, possibly uh, reduce it a bit. Industrialization, uh, I, from a, from a post-Keynesian perspective, I would say that rising inequality, it's certainly not good for industrialization. It depends with type of industrialization you have in mind. And the sense that if you look at the Chinese history, there was obviously a huge increase in inequality together with the um, progressive process of industrialization in that economy. Why? Because there was a modern sector emerging in China. And because there were people that were capable to make out a huge amount of money out of the Chinese industrialization process because it was industrialization uh, mainly oriented towards export. So uh, inequality inside China was not that much relevant in order to tame industrialization. Now probably things are changing. Keep also in mind that in China, you had a, a huge increase in inequality, but a significant reduction in poverty. So in China, what really mattered was that uh, the industrialization process helped significantly to bring out of poverty a huge amount of Chinese population at the cost of a huge increase in inequality, because obviously there were parts of the society which were much more advantaged by Chinese industrialization than others. So, um, but this is because Chinese industrialization was mainly an export-led industrialization process. Final question, not to take too much time, and in case there is a second round of question, happy to answer. The relative measure of manufacturing, if it was more related to uh, an expansion of other sectors rather than a reduction in manufacturing. Hypothetically, using uh, uh, a relative measure of manufacturing, uh, I could say yes. I mean, we could have negative coefficients just because uh, other sectors expanded more quickly than manufacturing. Uh, it could be, for instance, because there is a real estate bubble. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are capital flows entering the economy. The, these are mainly concentrated in, uh, uh, in the real estate uh, and they do not expand too much manufacturing. And therefore, having in mind the relative measure, this could, give, this could be a, taken as a sign of premature industrialization, even though it is not manufacturing contracting in absolute term. This is absolutely possible according to our measures. However, I would say that when this applies to developing countries, this remains anyway a negative indicator because in the case of developing countries, I would primarily focus on the, expan on the relative expansion of manufacturing more than other services. So if a developing country uh, are ex if developing countries are experiencing or are, are going through a major real estate bubble, a finance-led, external finance-led uh, real estate bubble, I would take in this uh, as a problem anyway, because it is not that sector that those countries uh, should primarily aim to expand. So even it is a relative uh, dynamics, and even though we don't see a contraction of manufacturing in relative terms, uh, this could be taken anyway as a problem. First of all, because a real estate bubble could create problems of uh, macroeconomic instability and then macroeconomic instability becomes a serious problem for the development of manufacturing. And secondly, because we have to focus on the relative importance of different sectors. Uh, you are right, hypothetically. Manufacturing is expanding, and so which is the problem? Yeah, but it is a problem of, uh, from a personal point of view, I think that the relative size of the two sectors still matter in order to explain the a more virtuous or not structural change in the productive structures of those countries. So that's why, from a personal point of view, a relative perspective still matters and not just um, an absolute one, just focusing on the absolute dynamics of manufacturing taken in isolation and alone with respect, to, regardless of what happens to the other sectors. I don't know if I replied to all the questions um, as you would like me to do. Yes, I think it was very complicated. Thanks.
Uh, no, just a quick question and a clarification on your answer to my colleague, Gabriel. Yeah. yeah. Um, about the financial integration and the less space for fiscal policy in, in developing countries. Um, I, I see that a lot in terms of uh, capital flows and capital controls in general. But what about the, the shocks? So, for example, uh, shocks of capital outflows, would that on your re recent research, would that restrict the, the space of fiscal policy or would that expand this outflow shock? I don't know if there's any other question. Okay, I think you can go, sorry. No, I think the shocks in terms of capital outflows uh, would definitively restrict the fiscal, uh, fiscal space for one simple reason, in general, uh, uh, central banks in developing countries, in order to avoid capital outflows, they will increase the interest rate. This is the first measure they will take in order to stop capital outflows. And if central banks, uh, and in general, uh, uh, even more, more frequently right now than in the past, uh, central banks in developing countries generally take uh, um, very conservative monetary policy stances, uh, this is another way through which they could uh, narrow the space for expansion or fiscal policy. Well, um, your mate comes from Brazil and Brazil is a clear case uh, of a very conservative central banks charging uh, extraordinary high interest rate. I mean, some of my Brazilian colleagues always tell me the, bi the biggest problem of Brazil in terms of economic development uh, and structural change uh, is that central banks charge very enormously high interest rates with respect to the profitability of the real sector. This creates problems in terms of uh, financing of the public sector, because obviously the public sector, when issuing bonds, uh, have to uh, pay very high interest rates, and this narrows the space of expansionary fiscal policy. And this also reduces uh, the profitability in the real sector and then incentives to invest in the real economy rather than giving, uh, giving rise to the so-called uh, carry trade. So the um, immediate response of central banks uh, against capital outflows uh, is precisely uh, a kind of uh, restrictive response uh, exacerbating the narrowness uh, of fiscal space in developing countries than 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 um, the other way around. So when countries are more exposed to uh, capital outflow shocks, uh, I would say that the fiscal space uh, gets uh, narrower. And what we are trying to do in our future research is precisely on top of developing a theoretical model to find evidence uh, whether the so-called fiscal policy space uh, um, is lower and narrower when countries are more financially integrated and when countries are more exposed to capital, um, international capital mobility. Okay, so thanks a lot for all these answers and for your presentation. I think now we're going to close the session. So, Thanks again for everything, and we hope next time we'll get this, the chance to see you here in Paris, hopefully. Well, yeah, I, I really hope in the sense that um, uh, I expected to wake up very early, but to take my EasyJet flight and then EasyJet uh, disrupted everything. So yeah, it's, it's <laughs> normal, no problem. But next time no. uh, it will be a pleasure to receive you here. No, for me, for me as well. Uh, and um, I will share with you my presentation. Uh, if you are interested, obviously, just drop me an email. Uh, and um, as, as I told you, as, 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 I, as I told David yesterday and the organizer, so if you like to have a longer chat, I would have liked to have a, a longer chat with you over a coffee or even better beers or whatever it is. But um, if you like, just drop me an email, we can organize a, a meeting on Teams or alternatively another event in, in Paris. I would be very much happy to, to join and hopefully be in presence there. Yeah, the, the pleasure will be shared and we'll, we'll be sure to remain in touch. In any case, thanks a lot for your presentation. Thank you. Hopefully see you soon. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Ciao.